and flying, you know, your own eyes, uh, driving, all that kind of stuff. You have to understand um, what is the core fantasy uh, that you have behind your title. And uh, then you go into human being, you know, human DNA, try to figure out what it's related to at a human level, and start to prototype this stuff very, very, very basic level and see if you actually understand and address that that calling. And again, it's a very like uh, um, kind of like people when you think about game linking, and sometimes things just appear out of nowhere. So everything I'm saying, the example of it is also true. But you still have to think about this kind of stuff. So start building in a way that's true for everything. So for example, Star Wars. X-Wing combat, end of Star Wars, the tunnel, another trench, whatever. Uh, space flight is fun, shooting is fun, uh, chasing something is fun, and then you go, you have Star Wars combat. So you can start to actually prototype using these elements and see if you address them and if people have that problem. Uh, then once you have some of these core elements, so for example, you can um, do, um, if you do like um, flight, a flight combat thing, you know, what usually happens is, you know, in the box of a uh, jet combat game, you're going to see two planes very close to each other, right, like uh, dog fighting. And of course, in your head, that's your core fantasy. You're playing the game, and what happens is uh, your enemy uh, is basically two pixels on screen, 10 miles away, and you're going to move your cursor and get a lock on it, right, and then you have a beep, and you press a button, and a missile goes out, and you wait a little bit, and then you see a little puff an explosion back there, you know, and someone's going to shout very loud, oh my god, you got him, and actually, you know, that's nowhere near the fantasy of what was in the box, and what you imagine when you say, oh my god, it's a jet fighting dog fight game, so guess what you need to prototype first, you need to actually prototype a dog fight, you don't need to actually focus on anything else, you have to find out how you're going to make that whole fantasy work, how you're going to make combat work, having two planes most of the time very close together, right? That's, that's the important part. So forget about like anything else. You can have just a plane that represents the ground, a dome that represents the sky. Put a plane that basically keeps, or whatever, a box, doesn't matter. Something that keeps roaming around, turns, you know, 60 around an open area if you're doing a 3D game and try to see what are the controls, the camera, and the stuff you have to do to keep these two planes very close together most of the time, and what are the skills associated to that, to get the dog fight going. Because if you don't do that, you're just going to get a plane, work on the controls of that little plane together, you know, just alone, and be like, oh, it's pretty cool. And then a few months later, you're going to work on the AI, and the AI is are flying all over the place, and sometimes they'll try to engage, and then the weapon system is not based on dog fight, it's going to be based on like missiles that allow you to block something 10 miles away, and you're done. Your game is going to suck, and be nowhere near what the fantasy of the game was going to be. You have to face your problems very early on and prototype, and for this, you have to understand what you're working on, right? So, as you're prototyping, you always have to remember in these kind of cases, what is it that you're trying to do, right? So in that case, the core dogfight chase very close together plane is what is going to guide every decision you make. Every time a uh, decision is going to make you like go away from this, you have to go away from that decision and come back and restart again and again and again and again. Sometimes you won't find a solution. Sometimes you will, and when you do, when you keep that as a part of your experience, you will have something that's probably going to be fun. But it takes more than that, of course, to be actually fun. Um, after a while, you'll see that a game like a jet combat game, um, for example, as an example, has several things you have to take care of. Like how do you detect uh, planes that are really far away? How do you get close to them? Uh, how do you manage the weapons? How do you manage uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, damage and all that kind of things. So these are going to be separated prototypes because you, they still have a core fantasy in them they need to work on. Then you're going to start to merge all these together and see if they still work together. Sometimes they don't, so you have to go back and reiterate again on the fusion of all these prototypes, and sometimes you're going to have to change something. So again, you have to understand 
for each of these elements what is the core fantasy. For example, when I do dogfight and I shoot at a plane, what are you expecting? If he just blows up and there's a puff of smoke and you go through, it's not that interesting. If you shred it, cut a wing, and the, wind, and, sorry, and the plane starts to spin, that's more interesting, right? That's the fancy what you were expecting from it. So that's probably a bunch of prototypes that I'm going to show you that, for example, there is a moment where you can use some kind of physics for the flying model, but uh, when it comes to the crash of the opponent plane, you might actually want to do something more cinematographic. Uh, because that you know that's more canned and might actually look better. And not only that, but by the way, when you're chasing a plane at I don't know like nine nine hundred miles an hour, right? If I cut the wing, the moment I cut the wing, that plane is one mile behind me. It's already gone, right? Because I just stopped its momentum. It was going forward. I cut the wing. Plane is gone. You're going to have to face that the plane is still moving forward, right, in front of you, on top of that. So even if you're moving left and right, you might actually want the plane that will crash to collapse in front of you, so you have the good part. That's the fancy. So that's part of the prototype. So you have a force to identify. I talk fast because I can do this for hours and hours. So, so it's very important to understand all these different components of what you're trying to do. That's the slow moment burnout showing you the crack. You know, that's the fun part of it. You know. So you iterate, you will find the reject. You know, this, you know, the shooting part, chasing the plane, space fighting itself, what does it mean, you know, the inertia involved in it, you know, what's different between flying in space and flying in the sky, all that kind of stuff. And you merge them together and you try to integrate these these gameplay prototypes together. And very quick, you will find that uh, iteration will be difficult. Assumptions will be challenged. Because again, uh, document making is not game making. So it's going to test your ability to uh, get rid of your ego as a game designer and accept that what you see is better than what you thought about, or that what you thought about actually is really bad. And then you should go another way and try it again. And for a game designer, it's the road to Zen, basically, and to success ultimately, when you're able to get rid of that ego of yours that prevents you to look at things the way they are and not the way you want them to be. And that is why, by the way, why I say that game design doesn't exist, because ultimately, good games are born by themselves. You're just a witness of what's going to happen. You're someone that's going to bring it to life. But there are many instances where things that you thought were going to be good are not. And it will depend on your ability to let the game go where it wants to go and not when you, where you want it to go. So sometimes you'll have to start over. But remember, uh, it's not, sorry, it's not now. It's not about how many times you, you fail, but what you learn every time you fail. And it's very important in a company, for example, that you promote failure. Someone that fails should be promoted, you know, not, not put down. You basically have to, you know, like uh, when, when someone can recognize that what he was trying to do actually doesn't work, that's a plus. I mean, that person is going to go somewhere, right? Um, and in design, as always, it's not what you add, it's what you remove. Good design is about removing. It's absolutely not about adding garbage on top of garbage on top of garbage. You know, if your cake uh, tastes bad, you can add as much, you know, whipped cream and strawberries on top. It will still taste really bad. And and anyway, so be really careful about that. It's not about adding stuff, it's about removing. So the more you go, you still have to understand your core fantasy and you have to remove things until you reach the core of the experience you're trying to get to the fire. 22 minutes. I passed. Um, 
So gameplay toy type should include all the elements of a gameplay toy. So what does that mean? A prototype needs to be a full gameplay loop. It has to be a worst case scenario. It has to have analog controls, skill based, and ultimately fun to play. Um, maybe we should look at this first to understand what that means. And here it comes. So Mario 64 was released that day in Japan. It was conceived as a Mario FX uh, prototype during the uh, Super NES years. So it was before the Nintendo 64 when they were exper experimenting with 3D. With Nintendo was experimenting with 3D. They did games like Star Fox on the Super FX chip and uh, a racing game, you know, and stuff like that. So they started to work on Mario at that point, prototyping. The game got released on the N64 as the uh, killer app. Uh, the new MIPS processor had the time from Silicon Graphics made that possible, C power, CPU power, and the uh, graphic processor and all that kind of stuff. That's Nintendo at work. Yeah, hello, Sam. Um, so one of the key for Nintendo at that time was to understand the fantasy of Mario 64. And the fantasy of Mario 64, the core fantasy of Mario 64 is to experience Mario in 3D. What does that mean? Well, for Nintendo, the decision to make Mario on a 3D platform as a 3D game was that you could actually see the full Mario face when you were playing. Because if you, for example, like the full Mario, you see his face, see Mario in 3D completely, right? So understand what was happening at the time. At the time, you would see only Mario's profile, right? That's the 2D version of Mario. Right. Others make 3D games like Tomb Raider, and the only thing you can do in Tomb Raider and you can see is Lara's butt. <laughs> right? Which was not the core fantasy, by the way, because in the box you could see her boobs. <laughs> but in the game you could see her butt. So that's very important because, uh, not the Lara part thing, it's not very important, but <laughs> what's really important is to understand that uh, Nintendo's philosophy of, of game making is that they're always they are always like looking very closely at what they are trying to do. They, they don't do anything randomly. Everything has a purpose, right? So for example, in that case for Mario 64, I'm making Mario 3D was to be able to see Mario completely in 3D. If they would not have succeeded in their prototypes in being able to see Mario in 3D, or the player as he was running around, they would not have released Mario in 3D. They would not have released Mario in 3D at all, right? So the key here is to construct again the fantasy. Uh, during the game, world in 3D space, moving Mario in 3D space, being able to see him, interaction with objects in 3D space, interaction with characters in 3D space, exploring a 3D world leads to all the Mario 64 prototypes. Uh, that have been going on uh, when they started doing Mario. So it involves all these elements working together. The camera, movement and control. Uh, so at Nintendo, that first, these first two groups plus the character are all the three Cs. So it's the camera, camera control character. Um, physics on quote, collisions, all that kind of stuff. AI on quote. And level design. And that leads us to the most unknown character, and most important character in the entire Nintendo history, which is Mitz uh, the Rabbit, hence the title of that presentation, which is Into the Rabbit Soul. So, when in 96, uh, 96 I was working with a studio, you know, game studio called Angel Studios, and we were working first party with Nintendo Japan, mentored by Yamashiro San, who's head of NST right now in Seattle, um, Nintendo Software and Technology. He had worked for the past you know, 10 plus years before on titles like the original Mario Kart, F-Zero and all that stuff. And he was cautioning me every day, uh, trying to understand what game design on 
what the Nintendo was all about. And the only things they could say in English were, uh, it's not good enough. And it was, you know, I came back home many times crying, and I was a grown man at the time uh, already. And um, it was really pure torture to actually go through that process with him. Uh, and the Nintendo group, the, uh, you know, the, the Nintendo group in Japan, because they, again, like, they are trying to make you understand what fundamentally uh, toy making and game making is all about. So, in 96, I had a meeting at E3, uh, at the time of the release of Mario 64, and uh, had a meeting with uh, Miyamoto-san, you know, creator of Mario and stuff, and uh, I had my lead programmer next to me, and uh, we had seen Mario 64 the day before, so my lead programmer at the beginning of the meeting says hi to Mr. Miyamoto-san, and uh, he says, hey, you know, uh, I uh, have read out the Mario 64 camera. And you know, was really puzzled and was wondering what he's talking about. I said, yeah, read out the Mario 64 camera. Because the big thing about Mario 64, when it came out, or when it was presented, is that when you were moving your analog stick, you could actually see you know, Mario running around and doing his thing, and you could see his face and all that kind of stuff. And it was really like the very first time you had a real like, full 3D camera and tracking the character at that point. So he had to work all night to actually redo this camera. And he was very happy to see that. And he was very intrigued. Uh, he was very intrigued. And he's like, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about. And, uh, and uh, Miyamoto actually speaks English, but he always uses a translator to actually get going, because it, it, it gives, him, gives him like a few seconds to think. You know, so he lets, you know, he thinks about the question and lets the translator actually do, do the stuff. And he asks again, you know, what do you mean the Mario 64 camera? And the other finally answers, I don't understand what you mean because there's 120 different cameras in Mario 64. So I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, there was no difference for him. So he explained uh, that faithful day, faithful day, uh, it took me years and years to actually understand what he meant, but I finally got it, and I'll explain why. Uh, he basically said, well, to decide if we were going to do Mario 64, we had to do two prototypes. One of them was Mario running around and see if we could actually see his face, his full body as we were running around. So we discovered that the uh, digital you know, stick, the cross, was hurting your finger and was not precise enough, so we put the analog stick on the controller and we started and we worked really hard on the three C's, you know, the, the camera, the control, and, and Mario himself to see if we could get to actually see Mario in his full, his full shape. And uh, the other one we were doing was um, the rabbit chase at the bottom, you know, the rabbit chase in corridors. And that was the end of the discussion. You know, from there we started to actually talk about the projects we were working on at the time. But I always remember that conversation because it was, you know, me and Leo talking to you. So me and Leo, when he talks to you and he talks about design, you shut up and listen. Doesn't mean you understand, but at least you record, right? So I record it. And then a few years later, um, I started to see things and realize um, what he actually meant. So hopefully this will work. Uh, Miyamoto and the Mario 64 team created MIPS, the rabbit. The basic name of the prototype was Chase the Rabbit. Usually, 
you go into a very comfortable place and you prototype something you know you're going to be able to solve, which is not prototyping at all. That's not going to get you anywhere. What you have to do is prototype what is going to actually happen in the game according to the core fantasy. In this case, the rabbit chase, which is one of the two early prototypes, they actually had to try to solve several, several things at the same time. One was camera navigation in tight spaces, hence determining uh, rotation speed of Mario on the tight space, camera tracking, collision bounds around the space. Um, because if you, and, and catching and following something, having the camera allow you to actually still track something that's moving fast in 3D. But if you solve this, you solved your problems in the game, or the entire game. For example, if you have a static object in the middle of a 3D world, that's not going to be a problem. You're done. You know, it's static. It doesn't even move. So you just go to it with the controls and the camera and tweet, and you get the object. If you're actually trying to chase something, you know, like the the uh, turtle that actually goes uh, the top of the hill in Mario 64. Same thing, your controls and your worst case scenarios are done. There's nothing else in terms of navigation that can be frightened about. You, you, you're done, all right? It means if early on you do your worst case scenarios, you will be done making your game. Then it's all about production and going into the render of how things are going to be introduced in the game. Catching an object in 3D space is hard. And development requires you to work all these things. The camera, movement and control, physics collisions, AI divided, fake AI, level design. Every time you're going to change one of these parameters by 0.001, you're going to have to retweet everything else. Right? You're going to change the camera tracking speed. It's going to have an influence on your controls. Changing camera position changing, changes your controls. I don't know if you experimented with that, but it's pretty critical. For example, if you do a driving game and you tweak your car on a surface and it, you have your camera tracking your car and you just drive around with the controls, it's actually very easy. You know, at one point you could like, for example, turn it off. Stuff you have to actually zigzag in between. You tweak your controls, it's playable no problem, right? After a few iteration somewhere. If I take the same camera that was there behind the car and I put it there, I just move it up, you can't play that project anymore. You're going to go all over the place. You haven't changed the control. It's just a camera, right? It's going to change and have an influence on everything. So changing your camera will change your controls. You have to feel it and you'll see. It will change the way you deal with your collision, it will change the way you actually have to tweak your AI, it will change the way you do your level design, you will have to change the camera, and you will change your controls, and you will change the AI, and so on, until you find perfect equilibrium. Or not, by the way. 36 minutes. Uh, the writing incorporates all the elements of a gameplay toy into the prototype. It's a full gameplay loop, right? I have to do something. I can measure my progress. Am I getting better at this? I'm not. Are people getting better at it? Uh, it's a worst case scenario. It has analog inputs, which means it's probably skill based, because if your input is digital, it's going to be, you know, like it's just on off, it's going to be, your skill can be based on tempo, for example, it's still analog. Right, you can still be tiny. Uh, it's skill based, and as you move forward, it will start to actually become fun. For fun from a brain reason, not necessarily like the outside look fun kind of thing. Right, fun in a way that your brain is able to feel things in the stick on the touch screen, get better at it, recognize patterns, release dopamine which is a very good drug that makes you happy and addicted, right? So that's the fun drug part of things. 
Thus, there are other ways to actually do fun, which is more like brain hacking, like casino kind of gameplay. But it's almost like brain hacking, anyway. So, I was going through that process throughout my career, trying to work on pre production and prototypes for a lot of, stuff, a lot of games. And at one point, you know, that meeting was really far, far away. And I started to doubt that you actually mentioned the uh, rabbit in the castle, right? So uh, for a very long time, I was like, well, I remember, remember saying that it was a very important thing, but I had no proof whatsoever. And I was starting at one point, was starting to fade away and be like, oh my god, maybe I'm like completely nuts and I may be not. But recently, actually, I was lucky enough to find uh, actually an article that he published uh, that was published in 96. Uh, um, for example, we have a rally for the Mario to a mountain summit, then we change the view from there and so on. So, miss the rally. And that way of prototyping is critical to the way you can do those stuff. And actually, to every team, there's a very, very successful title out there. So, turns out, the reason why I started to believe in the Rabbit prototype is that as I was going through my career, I started to see Rabbits everywhere. Everywhere in Nintendo titles. And they can take many shapes. They are not necessarily rabbits, but you know, they are worst case scenarios. And usually they don't waste anything, so that was actually, they are all included in the game somewhere. Right? It doesn't mean the game is about chasing rabbits. It means your worst case scenario prototype, we need to work on it very early on. So I found a rabbit in wave race, and it's actually a dolphin that you have to chase in mean, wave race, but it's there. Um, what else yeah, you see the dolphin, like a little bit blue on blue. Then that, when you start the beginning of the game, there's a guy at one point that says, can you help me catch my pig? <laughs> it's not that the game is about catching pigs, it's that early on, they worked on the Zelda character being able to actually catch something that runs away. Uh, including the new Zelda controls, which is basically you, it auto jumps, right, in, in, in Waker. If you go at the edge of something, you can uh, auto jump. So you have to prototype that early on. Turns out, if you go back into the old uh, Super NES version, 2D version of the Zelda game, uh, there are chickens in there that you have to chase and capture the same way. Um, that's an interesting story, 41 minutes. Um, we were prototyping at Ubisoft uh, on a game that involved uh, swords and guns, and, uh, um, and we, I was rebooting the project, that's when I was a uh, worldwide production director there. It's one of the project we rebooted, and I basically said to the guy, well, what about you restart from scratch, and you're going to take the uh, gun prototype and go into replay and start to shoot at targets with a Wii remote the Wii remote, and see if you can actually hit any of these targets, right? Uh, so they were like, yeah, I mean, that's going to take us a few days. It took around three months, you know, for the prototype to work, because it turns out if you just aim at targets with the Wii remote, you can't hit anything. <laughs> it's way too sensitive, and on top of that, it depends on the distance you are from the screen, because you're basically pointing the remote to the screen, and there's a cursor on the screen, so if you're close, it's not that sensitive, right? But if you're far, every movement is going to make your piercing go all, all over the place. So just going into replay, reproducing like a few targets on screen and starting to aim at that stuff, which is a scenario you're going to probably have in the game. Not a worst case scenario, but I was starting to introduce in these guys the doubt that things that work are usually easy, they never are. Um, they found out that yes, you wouldn't get anything. It turns out if you play we we play, you can't. And what they found out, their way to solve it was to basically make the collisions on the uh, targets like a, a plate, like this. Right? So that when your cursor would actually go really fast, it would have a tendency to go to the center. But if you go very slowly, it would 
which is typical of the ring wave. So when you're falling really quickly from one target to the other and you're really good, you can actually aim to the center and the collision will actually help you. So it took them like three, three months to actually get that right. Then we moved on to the next stage, which was also in replay. You can shoot cans and juggle with, you know, drinks, you know, cans that are bouncing every time you shoot at them. So that was another layer of complexity. And it's trying to stress test what is going to happen on a game, uh, like a first person shooter aiming at the wheel from one enemy to the other. But you have to create a reflex, worst case scenario situations. Uh, what's going to happen in the game is at one point an enemy is going to come out of nowhere and you're going to have to switch from that enemy to another one very quickly and shoot it, right? If you're in your prototype, you just have a static target, you're not prototyping what needs to happen. So juggling between two cans already is, uh, is pretty difficult because you have to go from one that's moving that way, the other one that's coming down, one's going up, and oh my gosh, we're going to touch the ground and before it hits the ground. Have to go. So you have to assist the targeting, assist, you know, assist the controls to actually make that happen. And um, so I said to the guy, okay, for well, the next step on our game, uh, we can actually move the camera around. It's a, like a first-person shooter. So you have the nunchuk where you can move the camera around and the Wii mode where you can actually shoot at stuff. That's another layer of difficulty that's not in Wii Play uh, because it's mainly, you know, to be. It's pretty good to be, the camera doesn't move. So of course, if you move the camera and look around while you're trying to shoot at something and move at the same time, it's going to be difficult. So we said we're going to go for the juggling prototype, uh, you know, shooting several targets at the same time. But as they go up, you have to move the camera up to follow the target. And when he's going down, you actually have to look down and shoot at the target. So it's going to be very difficult to actually make that work. And it took more than six months. And uh, on top of other things. But if you solve this, you're freaking down. Because what's going to happen in the game is you're going to have targets that move from all the place and you're going to have reflex moments that are going to force you to move from one target to the other. That's your worst case scenario. That's your rabbit. And it just happened that a few days after I asked for that prototype, the guy ran into my office with a GameCube and, uh, and said, I have to show you something. And uh, what you had to show me was this. I have the video. If you take Metroid, and at the beginning of Metroid, there is a mini game. Uh, and the mini game doesn't show up. No. Anyway, it's bad. Uh, but we can look at a picture. At the beginning of Metroid, the first thing that you can do as a mini game is a shooting gallery uh, trying to bounce targets uh, with, your, with your aiming, with your gun, basically. So that prototype we were working on is actually was the same rabbit that on called the gross case scenario prototype that actually we were working on. You can find it in Metroid at the very beginning. Uh, they use it for training, for example, you don't need to do it. But they had to solve, they knew they had to solve that problem very early on. Uh, by the way, MP prototypes can be ugly. Uh, do they look like 99 million units? Uh, certainly not. There are two kinds of fun. There's the fun to play, which is, again, like evolving your core uh, DNA stuff, analog control, skill based, pattern recognition brain stuff, uh, dopamine, addiction, uh, you know, kind of stuff. And then there's the other one, there's the fun to look at. So very often when you do a project and you're trying to show how fun a game is to a bunch of people that know nothing about gameplay and you have an ugly prototype, of course they won't understand and will say it doesn't look like fun. Yeah, but if you experience it at the level of muscle memory, pattern recognition, you can wait for actually pretty fun to play. So you have to be really careful to who you show your prototypes to, because you should work, uh, it's okay to work with ugly stuff. Sometimes you will have to actually beautify some parts because they will be part of your prototype for sign and feedback. For example, an animation will need to be done to show you that the guy's been killed. 
you know, that's a feedback you need to actually do your prototype or a particle system or anything like that to see if your game play loop is actually working. So sometimes you're in prototyping, you need to beautify things. It's up to you to decide. But when you show prototypes, uh, sometimes it's pretty ugly. So that's uh, Smash Brothers, Melee. Right? And that was programmed, by the way, by the uh, president of Nintendo. That's its gameplay prototype. Gameplay programmer, by the way. Right? Uh, 22.48 million minutes on the N64. That's a lot of minutes. Uh, so gameplay toys, to summarize, are full gameplay loops, worst case scenario, analog control, skill based. And ultimately, uh, sometimes they are fun. You know, it's not a guarantee, uh, but sometimes you will give them to someone and they actually enjoy them. Uh, the worst case scenario is the stress test. Stressful conditions, stress your systems. You know, oh wow, I mean, if, if, if the outside companies, industries, other industries were stress testing or making prototypes the way we do prototyping within industry, I wouldn't go in a car. <laughs> ever. Right? Because for example, if you think of the brake system, and our idea of prototyping would be like, oh, we're going to test brakes on a, on concrete, on a parking lot. And then they're going to work. They're going to work. We're going to be like, oh my god, I've done incredible brakes. And now we're in the snow. And then it's going to rain on the concrete, and no, oh, it was frozen right before, or and suddenly the brakes don't work anymore. So of course, when they do 